of Luc Ali. He's the regional advisor for South Asia and he's working with UNICEF and he's based in Kathmandu and he arrived only yesterday, he's extremely tired and he has some, also some cough and cold. So, but I'm very happy you could make it and um, I hope very, very interactive session should be there. So I hope we have time for questions and I leave it to you. Thank you. Hello, uh, good morning, salam and namaste. Um, I'm really honored to introduce uh, Dr. Sabina al Qaeda to you. Um, I came to know her name actually last year in Bhutan when the Prime Minister of Bhutan was talking about the, um, the Gross National Happiness Index. And I know that uh, Sabina al Qaeda actually worked with the government of Bhutan to design part of the, uh, the index. And of course, you probably know her from also her work on multiple dimension poverty index, which uh, she has led for a long time. Um, and I think this is one of the path-breaking work on measuring poverty. Um, and this is an immense contribution to the poverty we create globally. Uh, she is also uh, professor, uh, she's an Oliver T. Kaur professor in the, uh, and professor of economics and international affairs at the George Washington University. Uh, she is currently the director, uh, directs the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative. Um, and uh, we are all are excited and ready to listen to a very interesting presentation from her on multiple dimensions of poverty and its use. Um, so, Sabina, all yours. Thank you so much. Um, it's really been an honor to be here yesterday as well as today and with all of you. I've learned a lot and in fact I learned so much that I threw out the presentation I was going to give and <laughs> I'm doing something completely different because I think the direction of conversation yesterday um, was really one uh, worth entering and deepening and I thought that might be more interesting than lots of robustness analysis and regressions. <laughs> um, and so what I would like to do is just in a, in a half an hour. First of all, for those of you who may not work particularly in this topic, um, review a little bit of what multidimensional poverty measures are and the kinds of statistics and analysis that they provide. Um, using as an example, just a common uh, indicator, which is a, a one that can be compared across countries. But really building on the conversation yesterday about the need for statistics to be used for them to be timely, and for them to really meet and also create public demand for information. I thought I would then share a little bit of some country studies of countries and how they are actually using the indices of multidimensional poverty for policy coordination, for targeting, for um, use at different levels of government, just to give some ideas of, in a sense, how these are tools, and in a sense that then creates the demand for them to be more frequent and more rigorous. I do that bearing in mind what the speaker in the session before said, which is that clearly any measure can be misused. And I won't have time to say, but I think we are not immune to being misused as measures that could really crowd out some very important work on topics that are difficult to measure. And I'll just close with some observations from where I sit, which is at the moment using lots of international data about um, some of the data issues that were discussed here yesterday. So first to begin just with an example, which is a global measure, and, and there are little sheets on this. Hopefully it's very familiar, so I go quite quickly. It's a measure that UNDP has been reporting since 2010. And what I'd like you to take away from this is that it is like any poverty measure, in that it gathers different things from the same person the consumption of green leafy vegetables, the consumption of legumes, the, the different assets that they may have purchased in the last 365 days. But in this case, what is gathered is not aspects of consumption or of expenditure, but rather um, things like malnutrition, things like whether a child has died in the past five years, things like whether children are attending school. And so it's doing this at the unit level for each person in individual level measures. This happens to be a household measure, and so for each household. So from this data, a profile for each household is developed, which shows the overlapping or the simultaneous deprivations that they experience. 
Um, this, for example, is from one of our researchers from Cameroon. So it's, it's a woman from his village, and this is her profile. So the shaded boxes show that some of her kids are not attending school. They have a joint family system, and there's several wives and 11 kids. Um, and, and that they're deprived more in the living standard indicators of cooking fuel, sanitation, electricity, and flooring. The, the breadth of the boxes reflects the weights of the indicators, because they are weighted. And the reason that they are is that just as you make a consumption aggregate for income poverty, when it comes to social dimensions, you weight the deprivations marked as zero or one and add them up to create a poverty score. And in the case of the global MPI, to give an example, a person is identified as poor if they are deprived in at least one third of the dimensions or of the weighted indicators. So for example, uh, Rosaline is deprived in 39% if you add up the weights on her indicators. And so again, just as a poverty line in consumption space identifies people as poor if their consumption is lower than the poverty line. In a multidimensional poverty measure, a person is identified as poor if their deprivation score exceeds the minimum poverty cutoff. So that's the structure of how people are identified as poor, drawing on, in this case, 10 indicators. As we'll see in some of the other examples, it can be any number, Bhutan's is 33. And then we put this together in a very simple extension of the poverty gap measure. And what you do is you identify the percentage of people who are poor because their deprivations exceed one third, in the case of this global MPI, and you multiply it by what we call intensity, which is the average percentage of deprivations poor people experience. That is similar to the poverty gap, where you're looking below the poverty line of how people fall. And so this is work done with James Foster, who sends greetings to this group. And because of that, it also has a number of properties that were not um, available for the earlier tr tradition of basic needs indicators that were very strong in Latin America since the 70s and strong in Europe also since the late 60s. So this is the class of measures um, for which we have endless geeky uh, robustness tests, statistical inference, derivations of standard errors and things that would put you to sleep even before lunch. Um, but what I will demonstrate is, in a sense, some of the key axioms and what they provide in terms of the policy analysis um, that can be used from them. And so I'll do this initially just with an overview from the global data, which draw on primarily DHS, like the NFHS3 for India, as well as MIX, PAPFAM, and national surveys for South Africa, Brazil, Mexico, and China. So first of all, one thing that this indicator gives is a summary measure. The Stiglitz and Fatusi Commission argued that in a sense there is a value to having a summary measure instead of an eclectic dashboard because it makes weights explicit and it also gives a very simple but perhaps a clear number to answer the question of whether poverty has gone up or gone down or stayed the same and to be able to compare regions. Clearly it's not enough, but it can be useful to distill a number of social statistics into an overall aggregate number. So this is for uh, 102 countries, 5.3 billion people, um, the percentage of people who are poor in a very simple schematic, with the red being the highest percentages. And clearly the headcount ratio, the percentage of people who are poor, can then be compared with a number of other indicators. For example, the percentage of people poor by the $1.90 a day measure of the World Bank or other social indicators um, that are available. It can also be compared at the micro level at, to look at mismatches. And if you would like, we can also speak of mismatches within the MPI, but I will not uh, look at those indicators. But I'll just give an example of China. China, using the 2012 China Family Health Panel Survey, we find that 12.3 percentage of people are poor um, in terms of the income measure, and China uses income for its official statistics. 
and only 5.5% of people are multidimensionally poor. And so we might presume that these measures overlap and that everybody who is income poor <coughs> is also multidimensionally poor. And so in a sense, looking at the social indicators of malnutrition or child mortality doesn't add any information, particularly because the levels of poverty are so different. But actually, we find something a little bit different. We find that only 1.6% plus the standard errors, which go up and down, um, are deprived in both indicators. And that is actually a common finding when we have data sets that combine both indicators. For example, in Chile, by their national MPI, 20% of people are income poor, 14% multidimensionally poor, 5% poor in both. In Bhutan, 12.7% of people are MPI poor, 12% income poor, 3.2% are both. And so one value, in a sense, also of having an, a social statistic that's aggregated is that we can try to see what value added it may provide in terms of targeting, in terms of um, different kinds of identification exercises. Now, a, a couple things on perhaps what a comparable indicator will um, add, although most of my emphasis is not on the global MPI, but on national measures. But the global MPI that UNDP releases has one advantage um, in that however crude it is, it can be compared across countries. And it can be quite interesting to do so. So we launched this year's MPI in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire in June. And we focused on Africa, and in Africa, the fastest reduction of MPI was in the country of Rwanda, um, which from 2005 to 2010, and now we have data 2014-15 for Rwanda, had very, very strong reductions in the percentage and intensity of people who are multidimensionally poor. And that's all the more remarkable if you look at Rwanda in the context of its neighbors. So these are just the national levels of MPI across its neighboring countries. But because the MPI can be disaggregated by subnational regions, we can also put this in context of the subnational regions directly bordering Rwanda. So they're only divided by a political frontier. They share, in a sense, the same climactic conditions in the Sahelian belt, which is difficult, um, and, and other challenges. But we see quite varying levels of poverty. And so it's these kinds of studies, in a sense, this is the reason, perhaps, that sometimes it's used to, useful to have a comparable measure, although it's very crude. I also give the example of Cote d'Ivoire, which is the, low, the low, lower middle income country in Africa with the highest level of poverty. And if you compare it with its neighbors, we have Ghana, which has much lower poverty, but then it's surrounded by these very <coughs> high poverty countries um, on, on other frontiers. So it just helps to look across information and also to look across economic information. For example, Cote d'Ivoire has one of the highest incomes among the countries with neighboring levels of poverty. Um, but compared to Nigeria, for example, the average intensity of poverty each person experiences is lower and the income poverty is higher. So that's enough on uh, the comparative aspects. I think that the, perhaps another and the main reason that um, multidimensional poverty measures can be useful for policy is that in addition to giving the level, either nationally or by religion or caste or ethnic group or gender or age, um, we can also see how people are poor. So because we have started from each person and developed the profile of deprivations they experience, we can decompose and pull that out and see, well, who are the poor people and how are they poor? Um, and so what are the, the combinations of overlapping interlocked deprivations and how do they change across population groups? Um, so for example, in Africa, we decompose for 475 subnational regions. And for each of these, we can have the profile of poverty. This is for the regions of Nigeria and they're ordered from the poorest, which is Zamfara on the far left, Zamfara, Yobe, Jigwawa, and Bauchi, to Osun in Lagos, 
if you give an idea of the magnitude, in Zamfara it's 90% of people poor, in Lagos it's 3.8%. So a huge range of poverty. And you then can see that in Lagos it's health deprivations that really drive poverty, whereas in Zamfara, uh, living standards, education and health are in a sense equally contributing to their deprivations. And this has implications for sectoral allocations and for different kinds of responses. I think we have to activate windows, maybe not right now. Um, and the last bit, bit of information that multidimensional analyses can give is that all of what I have presented is available not only at one point in time, but over time, whether using repeated cross-section data as the NFHS 3 and 4, or using panel data. And this can be quite interesting because if you are a minister and uh, at the state level, and you see, these are the states of India, and you see how the particular indicators under your responsibility have changed, then there's a little bit more interest um, than just having a national score. So that's all I wanted to say, just to introduce the measurement methodologies and to show a little bit about, in a sense, the ingredients of analysis. But I understood yesterday that really the focus is on how these can be used to energize policies and to provide uh, more information on what can be done at different levels of, of states and districts. And for that, I turn to national multidimensional poverty measures um, that have different numbers of indicators from seven in Mexico to uh, 20 in El Salvador um, that have different weights, different specifications. Some include employment, food security, childhood and youth conditions, violence, and they have different processes of design. But in each case, the key is that they are tailored to try to capture um, the different priorities that surround um, the poverty reduction activities at that point in time. And I'll just give a few examples from these that perhaps might be of interest. These are some of the countries that have multidimensional poverty statistics in most countries. These are released the same day as they release their official income poverty statistics, and they're seen as complementary measures. Only in the case of Mexico, they've ceased to report monetary poverty separately. Mexico only releases one multidimensional poverty indicator that includes income weighted at 50%. So one feature is that, in a sense, they can draw quite directly on different kinds of participatory work. In El Salvador, there were two years of discussions with different communities as part of an ongoing process. And before this, the government had a draft multidimensional poverty measure, but it didn't include violence, and it didn't include places for my children to play, for old people to drink coffee together. And so as a result, they, they needed to change the measure to incorporate those dimensions. In Colombia, for the indigenous population, they did a special measure that captured the indigenous understandings of poverty, and they report that alongside the national measure. And so it can be useful either to complement or to create a measure in a sense, some sense that tries to pull together this work. However, as we know very well, it's difficult to do that, uh, as who aggregates um, different qualitative work is, is, a, is difficult. Um, question. Another example that came up very much yesterday was the use of measures to influence allocation. In Costa Rica, the Vice President Ana Chacon and the President have both, actually three weeks ago, passed a law, although they've been doing this for some time now, requiring budgetary allocation across regions and across sectors to reflect um, the levels of income and multidimensional poverty. So Costa Rica is an example of a country with very high social expenditure, a lot of pride for its achievements, but their perception is that they were not being efficient, that there were in some areas lots of duplication of programming, and in other areas there simply were not required interventions. And so they used the MPI as a control panel 
in a sense, to try to improve um, the impact of the public expenditure, not changing the amount, decreasing or increasing, but improving its impact. So these slides and all slides are used with permission from the government. Um, this is from Costa Rica, and they found that they were spe spending the most budget in the region that had precisely the lowest level of poverty because of the political influence of that region. And the highest poverty regions had much lower allocations. And so they have tried to rebalance the allocations, particularly in priority sectors. They also found that some of the indicators of their MPI had zero budgetary allocation against them. For example, they're very interested in educational quality and in students starting school at the right level so that they finish in time to perhaps pursue higher studies. And they found that there was no uh, program or allocation um, directed at the same. Colombia um, has perhaps the most extensive set of um, applications of the MPI. Colombia launched back in 2011, uh, Mexico in 2009, and, and others since. In Colombia, the MPI matches their five, four year national plan. So each of the 15 indicators reflect a target in the national plan. So until from 2011 to 2014, it monitored the national plan. It set a target for reducing poverty, and it met the target um, under President Santos. <clears throat> and one of the ways that they do it, and these are again their own slides, is there's a lot of political commitment. So President Santos chairs a round table with 15 members from the salient ministries. They cannot send delegates, and they meet three times a year. And they consider, in a sense, the level and trend of the 15 indicators in their MPI. So they have a very simple dashboard, um, because they're primarily not interested in statistics. And then for each um, year, they identify the lagging regions and try to do new responses. So for example, in 2010, these were the indicators that were not changing, and they had policies that responded. Um, early childhood care was not available, and so they developed a national strategy for it, um, and so on. So for each of the years, they can talk about the programs and how they were directly um, developed, in a sense to try to reflect failures in meeting their own targets. This is one of the ways in which MPI can be very useful and also very dangerous, because if very important things are not within the indicators, they risk being overlooked or their budgets cut. So I think that actually the measures should never be used alone. There needs to be a surrounding analysis. But at least they can perhaps be useful within the context of their own indicators. <clears throat> Another innovation in Colombia is President Santos um, is more of a right-wing government, very involved in the private sector activities, the role MPI played also with the FARC communities. Um, but they have therefore reached out to NGOs, faith-based groups, private sector, and tried to give them information on policy, uh, on poverty, to actually inform their own activities. So using initially a census map, and then very highly disaggregated data, they posted the maps of poverty online. And then they made an interactive database where these other agencies were also able to share what they were doing in different regions. Again, because they were finding there was duplication or there was a lack of awareness about what ins different institutions were doing in different areas. Um, just to give a little bit of an example of how, in a sense, some of the people reflected. Colombia is perhaps a little bit different in that their ministers are very young um, and very informal. It's, it's very much a blue jeans government. Um, but they, we asked them to share with our network of, of different countries that are working on this a little bit about how they use measurement in the course of their policies and how, in a sense, they used it together. So for example, the Minister of Health um, observed, as we all know, that clearly drinking water, clearly environment and housing have influences on public health and therefore on health outcomes. 
But what they were able to do is in the two meetings where they were not talking simply about the MPI, they were able to talk informally with their colleagues about uh, other ways of interlinking, or in a sense to inform their colleagues about the implications their actions could have on the other sectors. And, and so it's, it's quite interesting for us as technical people to learn a little bit from that activity. Um, and in the case of Mexico, like Colombia, it has done a very extensive mapping. It has a cabinet level committee led by the president um, for poverty reduction. But I thought what would be useful for Mexico and Colombia and Ecuador, many of these countries, is that first of all, all their microdata are online. Second, when the uh, microdata are released, the official poverty measures are released two weeks later. So the protocols are all there in advance. You run the Stata Do file, you run the graphics files, and it's, it's very timely in terms of its update. Also, the SADM SPSSR files are online, and all of the materials are online. Another thing that Coneval does in Mexico, Coneval being the institution charged with developing poverty metrics, both income and multidimensional, is that it develops state-level reports and goes to the states to share their own analysis so that the state level governments can understand and ask any questions. And it's very much a two-way street and it's become, to the surprise of Gonzalo Hernández Licona, who runs Coneval, it's become really quite a, a political uh, beast in Mexico. So state governors cannot win elections without articulating how they will reduce multidimensional poverty because of the visibility of this work. Um, the, the citizens are very aware of it, and they ask hard questions. So I'll just go through um, another few. Clearly there is a network of other countries that have international meetings and events. And I think the key thing ab about the network is that it tries to join together political leaders because their commitment and their passion is very necessary to mobilize the resources and the will to bring change, but they also come and go. And so alongside them, the statistics offices, the civil servants, the longer term staff are needed to create permanent measures to institutionalize an understanding of how to interpret and report and communicate them. And so we're trying to balance a little bit of, of the two kinds of voices. So that's a little bit on the national measures and how they are used, reflecting a lot on the discussions yesterday. So very much trying to bring out um, some of the points that also came. And I close with just a few observations in a few minutes. So a lot of discussion happened yesterday regarding the timeliness of data and of surveys. So I wanted to share a little bit just on PovCal net data, first of all. We know that there's been a huge rise in household budget surveys. NSS India, India was very pioneering in that. But there has similarly been a very strong rise in multi-topic household surveys that are internationally comparable, like the DHS, the MIX, the LSMS. And an even greater rise in national surveys that are also multi-topic, um, perhaps to the extent that is, is not seen here, um, but might be of interest. Um, as we all know, in terms of the 102 countries that I presented, most of them have recent data, Rwanda being 2015, a number being 2014, 2013, 14, 2013, 2012. And India is, is among the oldest. Um, and similarly within South Asia, India is the oldest of the international comparable data. These are countries ranked by GNI per capita, so among richer but also much poorer countries. Um, they're, they do, with donor help, um, USAID, UNICEF, and others, um, they do more, re more regular surveys. And the periodicity of the surveys tends to be shorter. So I think it will be fantastic when, if it, when an FHS style data um, occur every three years. But the LQAS Plus, Indrajit, and others yesterday, I put LQAS <laughs> on this slide, but actually many of you mentioned the same points was the need for even more timely social statistics um, for monitoring, for um, disaggregated information, and for, in a sense, using social statistics as a tool of management. 
So I wanted simply to share that there are 60 countries by my count, and this was quite a lot of, of detailed work, that do have annual surveys every year. Um, and these are not only the EU silk surveys in Europe, but it is Indonesia, which actually has nationally representative poverty statistics four times a year, Ecuador three times a year, Brazil um, is just moved to a rolling panel data set, but it's been annual for some time now. <clears throat> and then there are also um, countries like Mexico or Chile um, that have data every two years, a much larger number. And so it might be of interest to, to start a bit of a discussion on what would be feasible in terms of multi-topic data. Um, it, it's already in, in many different areas um, in occurring, but perhaps uh, there would be um, some interest could be generated by the creating the data and then creating the users of the data that would then continue to demand the analysis to be updated on a very regular basis. And so in that sense, some of the pioneers that we have seen have actually occurred at the subnational level, whether it was the state of Minas Gerais in Brazil, the city of Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam, or some of the provinces of China. They have implemented new surveys, analyzed them, um, shown the policy relevance of the analysis, and then created some momentum for changes that, that went higher. So um, with that, I will close simply by observing very much also drawing on many of your observations in the past days that um, we are here to talk about data, to talk about statistics, but the motivation is not to stop there, but very much to, to go the next step and see how can this be used to energize policy and how can we tackle some of the communication barriers and the barriers of timeliness and periodicity that would generate the kind of interest that will demand the analysis we hope to accomplish. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sabina Alkair. Um, that was a really very uh, substantive and powerful presentation. A lot of uh, data to assimilate. Um, I'll open for questions, but I'd request that you keep your question quick and short so we can take as many as possible. Uh, I'm quite sure Dr. Sabina is very interested in getting your feedback and improving on our work. Um, so we open the floor for questions. Uh, Yamin, please just introduce yourself quickly. Uh, Shortly, and then your question. Yes, uh, my name is Yamin Sundar. Uh, I'm the chief of field office here in Bihar. Thank you very much, Professor Kerr, for the presentation. I have uh, perhaps three questions. One is, you mentioned about the nutrition as an indicator. And I'm just wondering what exactly in nutrition did you think of measuring? Was it stunting, underweight, or, or any other indicators? Second, I think we do conduct a lot of uh, national surveys, like the NFHS uh, and the recently concluded rapid survey for children. Can we not take those data sets and actually calculate MPI? Or are you saying that MPI itself is a survey in itself? I'm just wondering whether that can be clarified. And third, where does India stand vis-a-vis -vis MPI? Is it open to, to uh, analysis of MPI here? So that because clearly there are a lot of issues in terms of caste, in terms of social disaggregation, and lots of complexities. And I think that the MPI certainly would throw open a lot of light in terms of understanding where are the, the, the deficiencies. And I think the Chief Minister yesterday also mentioned that uh, multidimensional poverty is something that he would be interested in. And we at UNICEF and Bihar are seriously thinking about doing this analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Please. My name is Govinda Rao. Um, it's a, an interesting presentation. It uh, brings in an additional measure of uh, poverty and deprivation. Uh, my question is, when you are having these multiple variables, many of them are interdependent. And how do you really assign weights? Because, you know, the usual way that in most of these things they do is use an equal weight. But um, are they of equal importance as far as deprivation is concerned? So, you know, I mean, some people may be just timing, and obviously, I mean, you know, that's, uh, that's one part. 
the, there are other factors which is the, how do you really assign the weights and that's all that. Okay, we'll take one more and then I'll ask uh, on this side. Tool or has this tool been used to actually also disaggregate within the household? Especially when we speak about gender, you know, the household as the unit of data or of estimating poverty can garb a lot of intra-household disparities. So, I mean, also for Yamin to talk of child poverty, I know UNICEF has done some work on that, but now, you know, we're all trying to work also with a very large government program here um, called Jivika, which is the National Rural Livelihoods Mission, where collectivizing women to, to into self-help groups to, um, you know, poverty is one of the, one of its main goals, but I think how do we actually make that more multidimensional and to talk about gender, violence, inter-household disparities, would be, I'd like your thoughts on that. Okay, um, we'll, uh, I'll ask you to respond so that you don't lose track of questions and then we'll go for a second round. <laughs> Thank you so much, and I'll respond in the order. Um, so beginning with you, Yami. Um, in terms of nutrition, this measure uses what was at the time the MDG indicator, so for children, it's underweight, two standard deviations for adults, it's body mass index, 18.5 or below. We use a different for destitution where we use severe. However, with the SDGs, um, there's probable that we will move to the stunting measure as that's now preferred, and we'll be modifying the MPI globally for the sustainable development goals. Uh, its target 1.2.2 is related to multidimensional poverty. <clears throat> In terms of... Um, India and the changes over time. Um, I'm a little bit embarrassed. I asked our team to give me Africa briefings and I didn't check and they gave me very outdated India briefings. So we did some very outdated work with the NFH just two and three. And it was interesting because Bihar at that point from 99 to 2006 had no statistically significant reduction in MPI. Um, the, scheduled cast, the scheduled tribe and the Muslim were both the poorest group within that decomposition and had the slowest reduction. And so there were some interesting things, but rural poverty reduced faster than urban, but female-headed households had zero reduction in poverty, but they grew in terms of the demographic sector. So there were a lot of interesting findings, but the data are old, so they're not interesting anymore. So I'm very much waiting <laughs> for the new data. Um, but I think that's the kind of descriptive analysis. And what I would love to hear from you or for you to do, all our things are online, everything is open. But if there are particular research questions that would be even more useful than just the descriptive work, um, it would be interesting to do together or for us you know, to, 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 to know. In terms of Gawain Rao, a very, very good question on weights, um, especially because I disagree with myself about weights every couple weeks. Um, and it's, it's a very controversial thing in theory because the weights in a pluralistic society should be different. So we've taken a technical route out following Amartya Sen's idea that a, weight, uh, a measure to be used for public policy should be robust to a plausible range of weights. So to give an example, the country that launched its MPI most recently, we did robustness tests. Um, and in the provinces, 100% of the province rankings were robust to changes of the weights between one quarter and one half for any dimension. They had three dimensions. And 89% of the 100 plus districts were robust to changes in weights. And so we try to see how the MPI is used in policy and do a robustness test for that to make sure that the policies are not gonna change if weights change a little bit. So it's like a sensitivity analysis. And in fact, you said, how do countries set weights? We support countries, they do what they like. Some do participatory exercises, some use the chapters of the National Development Plan. So far, all the countries that have official MPIs have used equal weights across the dimensions, and they have justified when they've deviated from equal weights across indicators. Um, but um, it's discussed everywhere. But I think the technical bit that I can do is just to make sure that a measure wouldn't be released for public policy use if it's very, very sensitive to very controversial uh, value judgments. And finally, thank you so much for the intra-household question. The global MPI is at the household level, and with the network, um, we proposed a gendered survey that would enable us to have gendered MPI, um, and we were trying to get that into the SDGs. It didn't work. 
Um, and so we've gender disaggregated this, you don't get anything interesting. We've done child measures, which are fantastic, except that children grow in their nightmare, two-year-olds and 16-year-olds. But um, where we have individual measures, for example, Mexico, the 31 countries of Europe, in it's Bhutan, GNH index in Bhutan, women are never less poor than men in the 31 countries and six periods of Europe, and usually statistically poorer, except in Portugal, the poorest country which, in which they're equal. Um, in Mexico, in Bhutan, uh, women are poorer or have lower GNH. So it's, it, it's very important to do, but our problem is um, the gendered data bottleneck. Thank you. Uh, Prabhat, you, and then uh, we move down the table. So please give the mic to I am Prabhat, and I work for UNICEF office in Bihar. Uh, thank you for the very thought-provoking presentation. My query is that can the dimensions of infrastructure deficiency, uh, manpower deficiency, HR vacancies, and ecological vulnerability can be added to this multiple thing? You know, because these three are very critical you know, to understand. One dimension of poverty is looking at the poor people, but then we also think there are reasons which are poor because there is no infrastructure, there is hardly any manpower, and ecologically it's very fragile because of you know flood, earthquake, or some other hazard or something. So is there a way that it can be integrated? Because we have some data available on these indicators. Thank you. Yes. Um. Uh, <coughs> there was a very striking sentence in one of the old, sorry, I'm John Reyes from uh, Branch University. Uh, there was a very striking sentence in one of your, one of your slides which uh, many participants may have missed because you went over it very quickly, uh, which said that of the 50 poorest countries in the world by NPI, India has the oldest data set, uh, which is quite an indictment of social statistics in India, uh, which used to be a pioneer in this field. So I just wondered, maybe you were too shy to comment on this and you went over it very quickly. Can you also give advice? And how come okay. India is now trailing behind all the other tourist countries in the world in this country? Can you please introduce yourself to everyone? I tried. My, my name is John Reyes from Ranch University. Hello. I'm Pradeep Chaudhary from JNU. My concern is, is there any research and attempts to generate MDI in the desegregated level? For example, state district level MDI that I want to do. Because uh, till now we have only at the country level. I hope. Okay, so um, we get answers and then we move to the third round. Thank you so much. So, Prabhat, um, if you use a household survey and you disaggregate to certain levels, then you have to think through the sampling structure and representativeness. But often you would have infrastructure data that you could merge. Satellite data is difficult, but we have research projects on how you can merge. It's key if you bring in ecological considerations, you think of poverty. Poverty is something that's a household experiences in the period since the last survey. So you have to think of ecological threats, and you mentioned them like floods, fires, uh, air pollution, that they experience in the same period. Some of the ecological threats are general and may not be specific in terms of location or who they strike. Um, and But the big problem is that with some of the other ecological data sources, they are represented by climactic zones, not political boundaries. So there's a whole technical exercise in, in trying to make the sample designs somehow talk to each other, which I think many w would be familiar with, but we are, we're one of those that are trying to wait for the answers to be able to do this more systematically. Um, but it's, it's very important, I think, as you said, to do. Um, in terms of Jean, yes, <laughs> um, India's and NFHS 3 data are very, very old, but we know the NFHS 4 will come. But I think that it is the case that, for example, Senegal, a least developed country, has DHS data every year. So does Peru. So does um, a number of other countries. Others, Bangladesh, um, we had a 2014, now uh, we have a 2014 survey, now we had a 2012, 13, a 2011, a 2008. And so there are a number of countries, China, it's every two years. So there are a number of countries that have much more regular uh, updates of relevant data that include malnutrition. There are many more surveys that would have education and um, living standard variables, but not health variables. 
And so one of the keys, coming back to a question earlier about the survey from um, Yamin, would be to add a couple health questions into existing survey infrastructure, survey questions. And that's what they're doing quite a bit in Latin America, where their standard questionnaire does not have um, direct health functions questions. Um, and then in terms of disaggregating beyond the state, so with an HPHS4, it will be possible. Um, however, just to mention that most governments, whether it's Tunisia, South Africa, Mexico, Colombia, all the ones I mentioned, do MPIs from their survey. So, for, sorry, from their census, Bhutan. So they've put into the MPI maybe not all of the questions, they can't put malnutrition in, and maybe not in precisely the same way. But they've put the MPI questions in so that every time they have a decadal census, housing population census, they can update the MPI to the local level. And then it's quite interesting, Mexico changed to having a census every five years in 2009, so it had a, a census interim to be able to update the MPI at the municipality level because they have very strong local government. It's quite expensive, and so they did a survey that's representative to the municipality level. They found it was 60% cheaper than a survey. So that's what they're going with every five years. So there are different ways, um, depending on budgets, of, of getting very localized data. Um, but certainly putting something in the census is, is quite a good step. Okay, so we'll probably take two more questions and then we uh, close the session. Yes, please. Can you give the mic to her, please? Here, in the front. Two quick things. One is that um, if you can kindly tell something about the indigenous understanding of poverty that you have mentioned. Is it about the displacement uh, that you're talking about due to modernization? And number two, anything related to conflict-driven poverty, you know, have you thought of it? Sorry, was the first religion or religion? Uh, that is the, uh, you have spoken about the indigenous understanding of poverty. If you can kindly elaborate. Uh, anyone else? Just one more question. Yes, yes. On this side. Yeah, just trying to think of the last presentation and this presentation. And uh, uh, we heard a lot of things like softer uh, issues and uh, which are specifically not objectively quantifiable and of course here we are talking about exact quantities and numbers and uh, from different surveys. So what is the, like, a, what, what kind of balance, like how can we put some, uh, or is it possible to put some of the, the softer indicators, empowerment indicators into multi-dimensional poverty also? Okay, thank you. Um, what about answer or? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, thank you. So in terms of indigenous, um, basically there are two options that have been implemented by countries to date. One is simply to disaggregate. You may know that in Latin America, indigenous poverty is a very strong but also a very sensitive topic. And when Mexico released its MPI in 2009, it was the first time in history that the survey gathered data on indigenous identity. And they found that where the national levels of poverty were uh, 46%, Indigenous poverty was over 70%. Um, and they were very afraid to release this result um, just before the, the, the press release. Um, but in fact, it, it seems to have opened a lot of space for constructive engagement and not the kind of tensions that they were fearing. Um, and as I mentioned, Colombia has done a separate survey for indigenous people, including the language of schooling, including different standards of housing for the indigenous house houses, what they, what they feel to be a, a good house, um, and, and a few other indicators. So those seem to be the two ways that are going forward, um, but it, it has seemed to be quite useful to be able to disaggregate by whatever relevant group um, in order to identify you know, the, the different uh, levels and composition of poverty. Indigenous poverty composition in Mexico is very different than the national one. And so that was completely profiled, and a lot of programs then were started to address it. And they had had a little bit, but because they never put in the survey the questions that they needed to actually disaggregate, they didn't have the information at that scale previously. In terms of conflict, there are different, again, ways. First of all, um, in Colombia, 
um, for the internally displaced people. They did special surveys and they found that while national poverty in Colombia in 2013, 2014 was 22%, in the IDP FARC groups, it was 38%. So reduction of MPI became part of the negotiations of peace there. Um, but there are also, in a sense, interesting findings that we didn't expect. So if you look at the MPI levels and failed states and conflict-affected countries, it's not actually black and white. And I, I have a map that I didn't put up today on Africa. But we found 19 regions of Africa that reduced multidimensional poverty as fast or faster than Rwanda. And they were in Mauritania, in DRC, in Congo, in Liberia, you know, places that have not necessarily had peace. Um, and it's quite interesting then to unravel. It's not no one policy in Dominican Republic, it's the nuns and another, it's a great governor. You know, there, there are lots of stories underneath it at a qualitative level about what has driven change. But I guess what we've seen is that it, there's not a, a simple story. It is also the case that some DHS surveys will not implement in areas of hot conflict. So we miss certain regions, and that's why you'll see little map, white bits in the map, because then <clears throat> we don't have data at that region. And finally, in terms of in, in the softer issues, that is a, a passion for um, my research group. So we started also by looking to measure the missing dimension to poverty data, which include disempowerment, violence, shame, humiliation, social isolation, um, informal work, unsafe work, and psychological states. In the case of Dominican Republic, they're including empowerment in their MPI. I'm not sure I'm a fan, because I'm not sure yet that the indicators will measure objectively the trends in empowerment. I think there may be too much of self-report, too much of adaptive preferences in the data. So at the moment, I would prefer it to be analyzed alongside, present in the survey, but not in the measure. Bhutan's gross national happiness measure, we're doing a similar measure, Ecuador and Bolivia. They have a lot of these soft indicators. But the problem is the trend. It could go down because it goes down. It could go up because people's aspirations rise. And so I'm nervous about including it in a measure that basically will inform policy whether or not it's working, because conscientization is part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you so much for a uh, very, very good presentation. And thank you for joining us for questions. Uh, as the chair, I can ask uh, two questions, but I will ask you on lunch. Uh, one is the relationship between multidimensional poverty and inequality, which is uh, obviously a very important question for the SDGs. And the second is um, uh, some sort of measure between how do, how do countries respond to multidimensional poverty in terms of institutional response to multidimensional poverty, and can we really relate those two or not. But that's a question for the lunch uh, that I'll ask you. Uh, thank you, and uh, we go to the next session.